Today on Blue 58, the Packers have answered one big off-season coaching question, sending Sean Menenga packing and replacing him with Maurice Drayton. Will that be enough to save the Packers' not-so-special special teams? And what's the deal with Mike Pettin? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. We've got action. The Packers have made a coaching change. They have fired Sean Menenga and replaced him with Maurice Drayton. They now have a new special teams coordinator. Drayton's an interesting guy. He's got an interesting coaching background. Some high school football, some arena football, some international football, some small college ball, some professional football. He's been everywhere. Will he fix the Packers special teams? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Drayton himself, as far as he relates to the Packers, an internal hire to replace Menenga. Not a huge surprise there. I didn't think this was going to be a super far and wide search. You never know with these sorts of things, but that kind of was the sense that I got. Just how Lafleur has handled some of these things in the past. That's actually why I think kind of related to this, if he does move on from Mike Pettin, you're going to see at least one internal candidate get some serious consideration, maybe a guy like Kirk Olivadotti. That's a discussion for another day, though. Let's see if Pettin actually does get the axe here first. Lafleur went with an internal candidate, and I think there's actually a pretty good reason for that. Drayton is pretty well regarded, it seems, around the league, and he's been doing this for a while. He's a holdover, actually, from the Mike McCarthy era. He first joined the Packers in 2018, when Ron Zook was the Packers special teams coordinator, and rarely were the special teams special at all under Ron Zook. And the same goes really for Sean Menega as well. So at least Maurice Drayton knows how not to do it. Prior to that, he worked with the Indianapolis Colts, whose special team stuff was pretty good while he was there. He was not the primary special teams coordinator. He was a special teams assistant, but they had good special teams performance in 2016 and 17 when he was there. So how does Maurice Drayton end up in Green Bay in 2018? Pretty simple. The connection is Joe Witt. Witt, of course, the former Packers defensive backs coach. He was uh, a co-worker of Drayton's back at the Citadel when Drayton was there in 2002. Witt actually got Drayton a coaching internship with the Falcons when he was a DB coach there. Drayton ends up as a special teams assistant, lands with the Colts under Tom McMahon. Tom McMahon leaves for Denver after 2017. And where does Maurice Drayton end up? In Green Bay, where he knows Joe Witt. Bigger question here is, does this change anything for the Packers? I don't really know. And I don't think anybody really knows one way or another. You can read all the nice quotes from people who worked with him before, and maybe they're right. Maybe the Packers got a good one here. Maybe he's going to change everything. Maybe they're going to entirely rethink how they do special teams. We're going to have J.K. Scott kicking punts left-footed next year or something wild like that. It's going to take the league by storm. I don't even really know how you would reinvent special teams anymore, Uh, but I don't think that's really what's going to happen. The big issue before Menenga himself was arrived, was penalties on special teams. Look back at the 2018 Packers. If you just Google NFL penalties, there's a site. I think it's actually NFLpenalties.com. If not, it's something close to that. That's not really the point here. Look at the special teams penalties from Ron Zook's last year in Green Bay. Josh Jones has two offside penalties as a member of the kicking team. Just think about How bad you have to be to line up offsides as the offensive team. I don't think I've ever seen that penalty called anywhere else. He's standing on the wrong side of the line of scrimmage, not because he was drawn off by the opposing team's cadence. He just stood in the wrong place. That's how bad the special teams were under Ron Zook. And at the very least, to offer the slimmest possible praise for Sean Menenga. At least he got the special team's penalties cleaned up a little bit. But it wasn't good enough. The Packers' coverage was bad on kickoff returns. It was bad on punt returns. 
Their punt coverage left much to be desired. They let two go back for touchdowns this year. He was constantly, it seems, tinkering with J.K. Scott's mechanics, which only uh, made things worse for what appears to be an already fragile player. It just didn't work very well. And so now you've got Maurice Drayton. I think it's hard for the Packers to be worse here. As to how much Drayton himself plays into that, I don't really know. But this is a good example of the flip side of a a lot of those kind of devil's advocate positions I throw out there related to coaching changes. You look at Mike Pettin, sure it hasn't been great, but there are worse defenses out there than the Packers. Say you change things and things get worse. It's a possibility. The Packers have been near the the been near the the bottom of the heap by just about any metric you use for the entirety of the Menanga era and longer than that. Surely it cannot possibly be worse than that. Certainly it's at least theoretically possible, but I have a hard time seeing it come to pass in a meaningful way. If they go from whatever it is, 29th in Rick Gosselin's special team rankings or whatever it is, the patron saint of special teams, Rick Gosselin, formerly of the Dallas Morning News, look for his special teams rankings out there. If they go from 29th to 30th or 32nd, okay, technically they did get worse, but how much worse did they really get? You might as well try something and change and hope that something gets better. Hope isn't really a plan. A wish is not a plan, is that that phrase we use often on the show. But at least here you've got something different. Maybe that's not so much hope or a wish. It's just trying something else. And I think that's about all we can ask for right now. What's the deal, though, with Mike Patton right now? Is he fired or not? Honestly, I thought we were going to hear something one way or another right now. But really, the only information coming out of Green Bay as reported by Rob Domofsky, is this. Mike Patton was on a two-year contract, which started in the 2019 season. He did not renew his contract after the 2019 season, meaning that now his contract is over. That's all we've got. Is he leaving Green Bay? Is he not? We don't really know right now, but it doesn't sound like he has a contract. And I would expect, I thought it was going to happen today, Thursday, as I record this, that we were going to get a release from the Packers saying, hey, we have mutually agreed to part ways with Mike Pettin. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's how things went down, because you can't technically fire somebody whose contract is, is expiring. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Packers just kind of said, hey, we're just, we're going to go in a different direction here. I think if he was going to come back, we would, we would have heard for sure by now. I think it seems like they're probably just figuring out what exactly the exit looks like. I recorded a little bit earlier than usual, or excuse me, a little bit later than usual on this fine Thursday evening, and I kind of expected something to break really late to say, hey, Mike Pettin is done for sure. I am a little bit surprised that that hasn't happened just yet. Although, let's check right now just to see if anything has actually happened one way or another. Nope, it doesn't look like anything has happened while we've been watching. So, or while we've been recording. So, good news, Mike Patton is still still in a state of uncertainty. But, I wouldn't be surprised if they did say the the kind of cliche line, we are are going in a different direction, we have mutually agreed to part ways. Well, whether it's mutual or not, seems like someone decided you were going to be parting ways. Mike Pettin can agree or not. It sounds like he's not going to have a job. I wouldn't get too hung up on it if we get to this point next week and there's no news about Mike Pettin. That is starting to get pretty weird because you've got to start looking at replacement candidates. And who are some of those replacement candidates anyway? If Mike Pettin does get replaced in Green Bay, like I said before, I think it is going to be somebody who the Packers who Matt LaFleur has some previous connections with. That is the first place I would look at the very least. And there are some interesting candidates when you just look at guys with whom he has a previous connection. Wade Phillips is the big name, sure, 
But he's on everybody's list. If you're looking for a defensive coordinator and you want a big name, Wade Phillips is the biggest name going right now. There are a couple other options that I think we should at least be aware of. First is Johnny Holland. He's currently the San Francisco 49ers linebackers coach and run game specialist. Only recently became that run game specialist. It sounds like that's the kind of job title you get when they're trying to give you a little bit of extra cash and a title just to say, hey, stick around a little bit longer so you don't take a promotion somewhere else. Johnny Holland, of course, a long career with the Packers. He worked with Matt LaFleur in Houston, 55 years old, and he got to like anybody off the San Francisco tree right now. The other name I would think about in the short term is Kirk Olivadotti. He worked with Matt LaFleur in Washington and now in Green Bay, currently the Packers inside linebackers coach, 47 years old. I like him as a a potential candidate just because of the continuity aspect there. That seems like a very Packers thing to do. I don't know if he'd be good or bad, but that seems like the sort of thing that they might be interested in doing. Keep a little bit of continuity, keep a guy who's well-regarded in the building around, and just try to stabilize things on defense, um, see if that helps anything at all. The other name is another one with Packers connections, too. I might think about Marquand Manuel. He worked with Matt LaFleur in Atlanta. Currently, the Philadelphia Eagles defensive backs coach was the Falcons defensive coordinator in 2017 and 18. Didn't go great while he did that, uh, but I don't think they had quite the personnel that the Packers do on defense when he was there. It's somebody who has some connections to LaFleur when he was in Atlanta. They were on the staff together uh, and maybe may be an option there. We are throwing at, throwing some darts here. Finally, last option, kind of a little bit off the radar, is Shane Bowen. He is currently the Titans defensive line coach, but he calls plays, or at least he did for a time, for the Tennessee Titans defense. Worked with Matt LaFleur when he was there for just one year. This may be a little bit of a stretch because he is only 34 years old, but he's he has the kind of profile and background that would get you thinking maybe he's going to be a defensive coordinator someday. And if you want to kind of go with a Matt LaFleur type candidate, that might be a guy worth keeping an eye on. Let's talk about free agents here for a second. First, some general thoughts. I don't really want to do the, we need to talk about all the free agents on defense, and we then need to talk about all the free agents on offense kind of thing this offseason for a couple reasons. First, we don't know what the free agent landscape looks like at all. We've talked a little bit about the cap, how it may not go down as much as people thought. We still just don't know. We don't know what things are going to look look like money-wise this spring. Secondly, outside of one or two guys, most of the unrestricted free agents we're talking about this year seem like no-brainer, just let them go and we'll move on. For instance... James Burgess, when was the last time you thought about him? Mainly special teams player, maybe played like two snaps on on defense this year, if that. Just move on. Billy Wynn, same thing. Montrevious Adams and Kevin King, two disappointing 2017 draft picks. No real reason to keep either of them around. Tavon Austin, fun story, probably gone. Damon Harrison, same kind of deal. The apple of everybody's eye on Packers Twitter for a long, long time. He's probably on the way out. Lane Taylor, too old, too hurt. He's he's probably on the way out. It gets to be a pretty sparse list. So really, you're talking about Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams, Mercedes Lewis, and Corey Lindsley. Really four guys that are worth spending any amount of time on at all. Jones, I think, is probably gone. Williams, I feel like, is probably going to get sneakily overpaid by somebody and end up disappointing a fan base when it turns out he's not a feature back, but he's going to get paid by a feature back or paid like a feature back. Perfect complimentary guy, Jamal Williams, but probably not your lead dog. So that brings us to Corey Lindsley. Let's talk about him not so much as a free agent, but as just a player the Packers really have to think hard about here. I think it's safe to assume, at least free agency-wise, that he is not coming back. But I think that's a safe assumption for just about every free agent right now. Just assume they're not coming back, and then hope for the best. 
it feels like there's a scenario where the Packers could sneak him back onto the roster, but that's about all I've got for you there. Just a just a feeling. And it's going to depend what the cap ends up looking like. But there's a good chance he gets paid to come be a great center somewhere too. So, if he leaves, how do the Packers address this? This is a question that I got from Blue 58 listener John. He writes, obviously the team will be changing this off season between the salary cap and notable free agents, but I still feel confident the team can be right back in the spot next year. It all starts with the goal of winning the North, and from there anything can happen. If they're able to successfully replace Corey Lindsley and the offensive line stays healthy, I think they'll be just fine. What are your thoughts? I will give you my thoughts. First, replacing Corey Lindsley just by himself. Let's talk about that for a second. There is a lot that goes into being a center. However, I think it's safe to say that of the three offensive line positions, tackle, guard, and center, center could be the easiest to replace, at least from a physical standpoint. At center, you need brute brute strength, and that's about it. You don't need to be able to move in space as much as tackles and guards do. You don't necessarily have to have the length that tackles do, and and some guards increasingly. You kind of just got to be a pivot point for the offensive line. Sure, you're going to have to make those reach blocks now and then. But the movement you do is much more within a confined space than any other offensive lineman. I don't think that's an unfair assessment. So the pool of potential replacement candidates is pretty, pretty big. Secondly, the Packers have had a pretty good run, just from a personnel perspective, of manufacturing centers when they need them. J.C. Treader went from tackle to guard to center in Green Bay. Elton Jenkins has taken snaps there, and he's just a talented offensive lineman everywhere. But even a guy like Lucas Patrick, the Packers have developed him into a center. Don Barkley was passable at times, not in any long stretches, but he could play a little swing tackle, primarily play guard, and moonlight at center if he needed him. That all these guys could do the job passably, I'm not talking like at Corey Lindsley's level, but like passably, leads you to believe that in a pinch you could stick just a pretty average to above average lineman there and get by, get by. So if we're just talking about replacing Corey Lindsley, I'm not sure that's as big a challenge. Not a one-to-one replacement, but just start finding a starting caliber center. And the Packers have options there. In theory, you could say, hey, Elton Jenkins, you want to be a center for the next 15 years? Be the best center in the league, maybe? All right, you're going to do it. Center from day one, here you go. I don't think they will because I think you can move him around easier if he's just playing guard. But that is at least an option. You've got Lucas Patrick, who, again, is not going to be a one-to-one replacement for Corey Lindsley, but he is an option. You've got draft pick from last year, Jake Hansen, who played a lot of center in college and seems like he could probably do it at an NFL level. Or you just draft somebody. Draft somebody who's already in that tackle-to-guard pipeline in college and say, okay, you were a tackle who was too short to play tackle in college, so you moved to guard. How about we just speed up that movement process and say you're a center from now on and go from there? It's at least something to think about. And I think they can probably find a guy they can work with better than later or sooner than later. However, however, There is the problem of how this fits into the overall offensive line as a whole. And I think finding a guy who's not going to be a weak link is really the ultimate challenge here. We've talked about offensive line in the past as a weak link proposition. Just don't have one guy who is egregiously bad, and your unit will probably be able to hold up. If there's no obvious place for the defense to attack, you can probably get by. That is good in theory, except the Packers 
may have two weak spots on their offensive line next year. Replacing one offensive lineman is a challenge. Replacing two is exponentially more difficult. What I'm referring to is David Bakhtiari's ACL injury. How ready is he going to be at the start of the season? Is this going to be a pup list sort of thing where he may be close to being ready to go at the start of the season but needs some time to really get up to speed and it's going to be more like week six or seven before he is in the lineup? If so, that adds an additional layer of complexity here. Secondly, if you're moving a guy like Lucas Patrick from guard to center and he's below average-ish at center or maybe just average, suddenly you've got a question mark at guard and at center. I'm assuming that Rick Wagner has moved on in the scenario and we're talking only about Billy Turner as a tackle. Then if David Bakhtiari is a question mark again in this scenario, suddenly you've got three question marks. And it feels like every additional question on the offensive line raises the uncertainty exponentially. One question mark is okay. Two get pretty concerning. And if the Packers do end up having to cut a guy like Rick Wagner for cap space, you start to really see a bunch of issues snowball pretty quickly. And even if you're replacing three guys on your offensive line, let's just use that number as an example. So you've got three new starters on the offensive line to start the season, a new tackle, a new center, a new guard. Even if they are good players, there's still going to be some cohesion issues early in the season. You'd have to think. There will be uncertainty on the Packers' offensive line heading into next season. The only question is, how much? And we're going to start to see the early parts of that story playing out here in free agency very soon. So I've got for you in this episode. Do appreciate you listening in. I appreciate everybody who takes the time to share this episode on social media, wherever you happen to find it. Uh, that makes a lot of difference. That's the primary way that we grow and also the primary we get more people involved in this conversation, this ongoing conversation we're having about the Packers, which ultimately serves to help all of us become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.